Imagine yourself at a yard sale and came across a painting that had a signature by Vincent van Gogh. How would you know that the painting was really created by van Gogh? The painting has all the same aesthetic characteristics of van Gogh. Based on your perception and enjoyment of the painting, you buy the painting believing it is an original. However, when you take it to an expert, they tell you it is in fact a forgery painted by famous forger John Mayan. Is there a perfect forgery? By definition, a perfect forgery is a production or a reproduction indistinguishable from the original. It's an applied art that relies for effect on the surface attractions of another work or another style, flattering the eye by pretending to be exactly that. For centuries, forgers have been forging paintings or sculptures of the highest regarded artists of all time. One of the most notable in history is used as an example in Van Meergen's Christ and the Disciples at Emmaus. An inventive forgery imitating Vermeer's style, acclaimed by Abraham Bredis, one of the world's foremost experts on Vermeer, at the time to be the highest of art, the masterpiece of Vermeer. And another famous forgery is the beautiful girl with the pearl earring. Can you tell which one is the fake? That's okay, neither could the experts. Are there artistic aesthetic differences between the original artwork and a perfect forgery? For philosopher Nelson Goodman, the answer to the question is yes. And for others, Louise Morton, Thomas R. Foster, and Thomas Kolka, the answer to the question is no. In discussing each of their positions, whether an identical forgery shares the same aesthetic properties as an original, it's my position that there cannot be an aesthetic difference between two visually identical pieces of art, which isn't necessarily a negative outcome. It's in fact an indicator that art is appreciated for more than just its artwork's form. It's appreciated both aesthetically and for its innovation, and most importantly, its position in the history of art. For philosopher Nelson Goodman, he sets forth this question. Is there any aesthetic difference between the two pictures, meaning a genuine work of art and a forgery, or copy, or reproduction of it, for X at T, where T is a suitable period of time? If X cannot tell them apart by merely looking at them at T, or in other words, can anything that X not discern by merely looking at the pictures at T constitute an aesthetic difference between them for X at T? In this statement, X represents the person perceiving whether there are any aesthetic differences between the artworks, and T represents the moment in which X is viewing the artworks. What Goodman is asking here is whether there can be any aesthetic difference between the two artworks if person X cannot at the given time of T, see any difference in the artworks. As said earlier, Goodman's position on this is that there indeed is an aesthetic difference between the original artwork and the forgery. In an example used by Goodman, he says, if Rembrandt's Lucretia was on the left and a perfect fake on the right, but we know from fully documented history that the painting on the left is the original and the one on the right is a forgery, that although we cannot see any difference between them, the way we perceive the paintings is determined in part by our knowledge of certain facts about its history. And even if the paintings were moved while we sleep, and still we could not see any difference by merely looking, the unperceived differences between the two paintings is pertinent to our visual experiences of them and constitutes the aesthetic difference he is speaking about. Goodman further takes the position on the common sense argument as follows, which states, 1. There can be no aesthetic difference without a perceptual difference. 2. There is no perceptual difference between an original artwork and a deceptive forgery of it. And 3. Therefore, there is no aesthetic difference between an original artwork and a deceptive forgery of it. Goodman accepts that the common sense argument is a valid argument, but denies premise 2 of the argument that there is no perceptual difference between an original artwork and a deceptive forgery, where he states, what else is a deceptive forgery or fake than a work where there is no perceptual differences between it and the original of which is a copy? In denying premise two, his argument stands on that we can perceive extreme subtle differences between two paintings, and for that reason, there are aesthetic differences between them. He further argues that those minute differences, once perceived, can alter the whole design, feeling, or expression of a painting. 
Goodman is never really clear on what he designates as extremely subtle differences, which can significantly alter one's aesthetic experience. If one can, at some point, pick up on the differences between an original and a forgery, then one's experience of the two artworks can change. Once one picks up on the subtle differences between paintings A and B, the aesthetic experience one has of painting A can be much different than the aesthetic experience one has of painting B, even if the works are practically identical. In Lewis H. Morton and Thomas Foster's article, Goodman, Forgery, and Aesthetic, they analyze Goodman's view that there is an aesthetic difference that can be perceived by merely looking at two paintings with unperceived differences, which are pertinent to our visual experiences of the forgery. Further, they take a realistic view towards Goodman's suggestion that once we have knowledge of the forgery, it gives us reason to believe that we can learn to perceive. And secondly, now that we know how to look at the paintings differently, there is an aesthetic difference between the paintings. Morton and Foster conclude that Goodman's conclusion is not sufficient, as Goodman moves from how we perceive to what we perceive, which is illegitimate. As you might as well say that once the audience has knowledge that the two artworks are different, it will enable them to discriminate between them just as artworks. As a result, they take the position that in the case of forgeries, where there must be differences between two paintings that does not amount to an ability to perceive them, nor to knowledge how to even to start looking for them in practice. This is especially the case when the forgery is agreed to be a perfect fake, nor in sense of being perceptually equivalent to the original. For example, the invisibility of the differences. For Mort and Foster, Goodman is relying too heavily on experts to notice the difference between two paintings that can only be recognized beyond doubt with the help of sophisticated scientific instruments or with the help of information which generally is external to the mere perception of the work. It would then follow from the perception of the fake that these differences cannot be perceived and that respecting the principle of acquaintance, meaning what is perceived is through first-hand experience of the painting only and cannot be transmitted from person to person and thus cannot be aesthetically relevant. So if a judgment of aesthetic difference is dependent on knowledge of any of these unperceivable features, then the two paintings are aesthetically different for an audience, whether or not they are visually identical. Consequently, Morton and Thomas conclude there is no aesthetic difference between an original artwork and deceptive forgery of it. In Thomas Kolka's article, The Artistic and Aesthetic Status of Forgeries, he finds Goodman's argument mysterious of how one's future ability to discriminate could make any impact on one's present-day aesthetic judgment. Further, based on Goodman's position that it's the audience's belief of minute differences in the future that makes the perceptual differences in the artwork, not their actual aesthetic value judgment at work. It's Kolka's view of art as to two separate categories. One side of this view deals with the aesthetic value of art and the other deals with artistic value, which he calls art historical value. According to Kolka, our aesthetic judgment is based on whether artwork is well balanced. The colors are harmonious, the contrasts are telling, the picture is dynamic, the picture expresses tension, etc., which are all features that are relevant of its aesthetic value. And what it inspired the work, to what extent it's the original, whether it points to new directions, and how it's new features were further developed by other artists are factors that are relevant for the determination of artistic value. It is here where we see the difference between aesthetic value and artistic value. Aesthetic value depends on the formal features of a work and artistic value depends on its historical and contextual features. For Kolka, each category does not seep into the other. As an example of this artistic value, he uses the famous painting of Picasso Les Demois de Avion. Although this painting may not have been Picasso's finest aesthetically, in fact Picasso and his friends hated it, 
For Coca, its artistic value is what's doing the work in the painting, not the aesthetic qualities. So the problem for forgeries is in their art, art her, historical value for Coca. The reason is that the forged work has a different art history than the original work. The forgery may not differ in aesthetic value, but there is a significant difference for Coca in its artistic value. Since we value both the aesthetic and artistic aspects of the artwork, we might be impressed by the work's aesthetic value, yet be unimpressed by its artistic value and vice versa. Aesthetic and artistic value are both taken into consideration when we weigh a perfect copy against an original. Therefore, for Kolka, this solves the problem with forgeries, since the artistic value of the forgery is not equal to the artistic value of the original. The value of each work is different based on its artistic historical value. Now let's put the philosophers to the test. Recently, I visited the Fine Arts Museum in Houston, Texas, where I asked patrons while they were viewing several different masters of paintings. If they were told that the painting in which they were viewing was a fake and forgery, would it change either the aesthetic experience of the painting for them, or would it change the history of the painting? Although two of the patrons chose not to be on camera, they offered their opinions, and for one it would change her aesthetic experience, and for the other he said it would change the history behind the painting. The next two women were gracious enough to give their opinions on camera. Let's see what they had to say. Um, I'm, hi, I'm taking a philosophy of art class mm -hmm. and in reviewing this painting, um, if I told you that it was a fake and forgery, um, how would you feel? Would you feel that one philosopher says that it would take away, um, if you know the knowledge um, that it's a fake, would it change how you perceive the painting and take away from the aesthetic experience of the painting? Or the other philosopher says that it would take away the um, artistic, the artist's attention, the master of the painting, and the artist, the um, history of the painting for you if it was a fake? I think if it was a fake, it would be the history part that's more affected, like the skill that it took, than like, the artist. Okay, yeah. thank, thank you. you. <laughs> you were asking about the Picassos. They're, they're at, the e at the end of this chain of galleries. So if, um, there's two paintings here that I tell you that one is real and one is the fake. Um, one philosopher says that it would change, once I tell you the knowledge that one is fake and then one other one is real, would it change your aesthetic experience of the painting, of how the painting is reacting to you, or is it more important to you that the, the uh, history of the painting and the master, is that what's more important to you? Once I tell you the knowledge of the artwork, is that what's more important? Is the question, am I reacting to the aesthetic experience myself? Right. Or is information you, about it more important than forming my opinion? Right. Are you, is it more important to you that the artistic history of the painting and the master more important to you? Or is it the aesthetic experience that you're getting of how you're perceiving the painting does that change for you about the fake and the, and the real one? Which one philosopher do you believe? I think it should just be my own reaction to the painting, the aesthetic experience. But I believe just psychologically you can't help being affected by the information that you know about a painting once you know it. Right, so the artistic history is more, is, based, is it more important to you about the painting? I would say I don't think it's more important, but I think you can't stop that influence. Okay. Would it change your aesthetic experience of the painting if you knew that one was real and one was a fake? Not intentionally, but I bet it would, just, be, just because that's the way psychology works. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> As you can see, each had a different position. One said it would change her historical aspect of the painting 
and the other the aesthetic, much like the arguments I have discussed. Now, do you remember this painting? I showed it to you earlier during Nelson Goodman's question. The painting is titled An Unknown Man. It's a forgery, and it's considered to be one of the closest to perfect forgeries of all time. Only the forger knows who the forger is, as the forger is also known as unknown. So when using Goodman's question, can anything that X does not discern by merely looking at the pictures at T constitute an aesthetic difference between them for X at T? Does the knowledge for you that the painting you are currently perceiving a forgery change the aesthetic value of the painting? Or did it change how you discriminate against the painting as an artwork? Or did it change the artistic value of the painting for you? In closing, the main aesthetic problem that forgery possesses is that typically no deception is practiced concerning the aesthetic differences of the forged art. Thus, the forger does not deceive us about the disposition of observable qualities of the art. The observable aesthetic differences is a function of appearance alone and is irrelevant to its aesthetic worth. Whatever false beliefs we might be induced to have about the work, those beliefs cannot affect an honest judgment of its aesthetic value. It's my position that a perfect fake, along with the original, are alike only in their external aesthetic features and not in the intrinsic aesthetic values, which the differences are tremendous. As the forgery is void of those key elements of art historical value, the authenticity which emphasizes the uniqueness and the originality. It's on this basis I find Kolka's position persuasive and simple. Not only does it give it the distinction between the artistic value and aesthetic value, it has a sufficient justification to favor many originals to forgeries. Moreover, art critics and art lovers need not admit that they were wrong about their aesthetic judgment, as they had the wrong art historical information so they could not properly judge the work's artistic value. Therefore, Although their initial aesthetic judgment was right, their judgment of the work's overall value was not.